So Beeks, I'm insanely excited to show you this one today. This is something that my nephew, Tommy Arnzen and I came up with. If you have Wi-Fi in your B-Yard, you can have this send an email directly to yourself every day, every night, every hour, whatever you want to have. And when you see something cool, you can put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook or whatever. Tommy and I, I remember saw a butterfly that sat down on one of our hives and was just watching the bees go back and forth. It creates almost a social environment, especially if you're beekeeping with some other people. So my family, my parents, my siblings, we did beekeeping back in the 80s and 90s. My nieces and nephews came to me in the early 2020s and said, we really would like to get into beekeeping as well. It's kind of a family tradition. Could you help us to get into beekeeping? And it's rekindled my interest in beekeeping. When we started, my nephew, Tommy Arnzen, and I talked a little bit about how could we not just put bees out there, but automate the process of being able to monitor them. Initially, I designed something like this with just off-the-shelf products. I had built it for my garden to be able to take snapshots every day of my garden to see how it's growing over time. I asked Tommy if he'd be able to take it and modify it and see what he could do with it. And he did some amazing things like putting a temperature sensor on it, taking all of the pictures from our apiary and send them in one email. So what I'd like to do today is show you how to make this kind of a thing, simpler version of it. I'm gonna go a little off topic and share something with you that surprised me a great deal. I was 300 miles away for Easter after reinstalling the BCC TV in the spring, a little earlier than I typically do. I got the email from the program like usual. It surprised me that not only was there a lot of pollen coming in, and even some drones coming in and out. This early in the season, I couldn't find any flowers to save my life. There's yellow pollen coming in, there's orange pollen coming in, which was a bit early in the season. But one of the things that surprised me the most was this streak of indigo that I started to see come through. I'll do this in slow motion. But you can see here, the bees in their pollen baskets have this indigo blue. Take a look at the bee at the lowest point here. Just indigo blue pollen in her pollen basket, which really surprised me. And here's another in the upper right-hand corner. It made me start wondering what kind of flowers that they were foraging from. And I realized that there are quite a few that start up very early in this area in Chicagoland. I think this shows the improved experience that you can have with your bees using this kind of technology. I tried to make sure when I put this DIY together step by step that it would be easy enough that somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience with electronics, doesn't have a lot of experience with woodworking, would be able to build this themselves. You can definitely do this with the material I've provided. So without further ado, let's go ahead and Get started. Today we'll build this entrance camera. It's easy to build, it's cheap to build, and we're using components that are right off the shelf. I have a link in the show notes that allows you to be able to follow along, be able to see all the different components, and to break this apart and see what all of the different components are in the breakout. You can look at the camera and then all of the fasteners that are holding it in place. We'll be using a Raspberry Pi. For those of you that aren't familiar with Raspberry Pi, it's a small but powerful computer that is only about 15 bucks to 20 some bucks. Please don't let the Raspberry Pi intimidate you. It's as easy as using your desktop computer. It has a power cord and then it also has an SD card, which is where we're gonna be storing all the photos and the videos of our bees. Then of course we have the outer cover, which keeps this weatherproof. I honestly think I couldn't have made this easier to build this thing. You can clone it over and over again and just reuse the same software. I have not put microphones into these, but if you all would like to see microphones on this, Put it in the comments and I'll put it together. Tommy and I designed this to be on the front entrance. The reason for the front entrance is that this is where all the bees activity on the outside of the hive occurs. You see them coming in, you see them coming out, you see them bearding. The only time that you have any real issues is when there's so many bees that they're bearding not only here, but also on the camera. Then you're not able to see a whole heck of a lot, but that doesn't typically happen all day. So if your bee yard has Wi-Fi, you can set this up to the Wi-Fi and directly email yourself. I'll walk you through step-by-step step how to set up the email program. And if you don't have Wi-Fi in your apiary, no worries. There's a lot of different solutions for that as well. I'll show those to you later in the video. So regarding the emails, you can have the device email you every day a photo of what's going on with the bees, or you can have it send you a video and be able to view the video in the email or, or be able to download it directly. So beyond the emails, I also built a web server onto the device itself. So this is a web browser. You can see that I went to hive1.local. I can go and look at today's photos. That's a pretty funny one with the B. You can click the two dots to go back and then go to videos and watch one of the videos right in your browser. I developed this capability to be able to use this in a B yard without having to have any network connectivity at all. 
We'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. I've also built a very simple setup program. It'll walk you through all the things that you need to configure. It'll also check for errors and that type of thing. I know I keep saying this, but I, I really want this to be so super simple that anybody can set this up and be successful with it. Some of you may be saying, you know, I could just go out and buy a Nest camera by Google and put that into my apiary, put one on every hive, and it does a lot of these types of things. For the expense, you'd, you'd have to go to the bank to take out a loan. For the Nest camera, you're talking somewhere around $130, $150 per camera and then you add in the service that you have to pay on a monthly basis. With these, they're cheap to build, there's no service charge, unless you really wanna pay me a monthly stipend, I wouldn't mind. Beyond that, the Nest is really big. In comparison, we're gonna be showing you how this fits directly onto the Hive entrance. It's a natural fit. The types of cameras that you can use for this is almost endless. You can use nighttime cameras, you can use higher megapixel cameras. I suggest that when you start out, you start out with the camera that we have in the build of materials. Oftentimes when you're dealing with different types of cameras, they have different configurations. I'm really trying to make this as simple as I possibly can in order for you just to get started with these cameras. Once you've done that, I would suggest that you go out and experiment with different types of things like the nighttime, like the higher megapixel fisheye lens. Let us know in the comments what you figure out. So we have one of these cameras on every one of our hives in the apiary. But beyond that, we actually have one that's for the apiary itself. When you're dealing just with the hive itself, the bees are really only coming in and out during daytime hours. So really sticking with a normal camera that only has daytime, it works okay. And you're not going to see a lot of activity from the bees themselves during the nighttime hours. I wanted to mention also really quickly, some of you may see this online. It's called a Noir or a No IR camera. It's able to see things in the dark, essentially. You may be tempted to go ahead and buy this instead of just a regular daytime camera. I would suggest against that, especially for the first build. And the reason that I say that is no IR just means that it doesn't have an IR filter. What that really means is you need to actually provide infrared in order for anything to be seen. So I couldn't take an entirely dark room and use this camera and be able to see in the dark. It's not really the, the way it works, and it's a little bit deceiving when you first read about these things. If I were building this outside, I would have to provide the light myself using LEDs or some other light source, probably not a flashlight. And so if I was going to use this in the dark, it would work very effectively with an infrared light source like this one. Some of the ways that Tommy and I got around this was we actually put a proximity light that would just light up and then these would work beautifully. I'll show you some side-by-side -side examples of the regular versus the no IR. Here's my setup to show the difference between the Noir camera and the regular camera, both focusing on the same scene. I put a few bees in there just to make it interesting. Now with the no IR, what you end up seeing is it has a pinkish tint to a typical daytime picture. So not only can you not see in the dark with this without infrared, but for daytime pictures, it has sort of a pinkish tint to it because it doesn't have that IR filter on it. I'm going to show you how to set up your Google account in order to be able to email yourself. What we found out over the years is it's cleaner to be able to create a brand new Google account to send these from. The reason is that you're able to filter on these in your own personal email inbox and you're able to see what it's coming from rather than coming from your own account. If you'd like to use your own account, that's fine too. You can just skip this first step. So let's start out. We'll just call it B camera, put in date of birth. I'll just call it something funny like tech B email, create a password. Just go through all the prompts to be able to create the new email account. Once it's been created, you'll get to this screen. You already have an existing Gmail account. Simply click on your profile picture, go to manage your Google account. It'll bring you back to where we were before. Click on security. You'll need to turn two-factor authentication on. This is always a good idea anyhow. It makes it harder for somebody to hack you. Once you've enabled two-step verification, click on it. Then click on app passwords. You need to create an app password for this application. We'll name this email. Create it. You'll get this app password that gets generated. You'll only see this once, so make sure that you copy this and store it away somewhere secret. For anybody looking to hack me, just FYI, I'll be changing this right after I'm done with the video. On to the next step. Let's get physical. So for this step, all we need is a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W. Then we're going to have a ribbon cable in order to connect the Raspberry Pi Zero W to the camera. This will power the Raspberry Pi Zero. And then we're going to use a micro SD card and a micro SD card reader. This just plugs directly into this. This will be our next step is to plug this into the computer with a USB-A 
or a USB-C connector. And I'll show you how to install the software and get this installed correctly. It's super easy to do. The first thing we'll do is we will download the Raspberry Pi Imager. You can download it for the Mac OS or Windows machine, depending on what kind that you have. Both of them work exactly the same. Once the Imager is installed, we'll do the Raspberry Pi device. This will be the Raspberry Pi 02W. You could also do the Raspberry Pi 0W if that's what you ended up buying. The most important piece is that the W is there. W stands for Wi-Fi, which means it's Wi-Fi enabled. If it doesn't have the W, you don't want to be using it because you're not going to be able to access it via Wi-Fi. Then we want to choose the default uh, Raspberry Pi OS and then the default here storage. Click Next. Click on Edit Settings. And we'll go to General. We'll set the host name. Use the username Tech B, which will be important later. We will do Tech B just with an exclamation mark at the end. Then we'll put in what our home Wi-Fi is, so what the SSID is, and then whatever the password is for your home internet. If you live in the United States, like myself, you'll put US here. You can choose whichever country you live in, and then time zone and whatever layout of keyboard you have. For me, it's the United States. Then we'll go to services, make sure that we have enabled the SSH and password authentication. Everything else will be default. We'll click save and then yes and yes. Then it'll ask us for a password. So I just took this off the computer. The image has been installed on the micro SD card. We'll take this out and we will put it into the Raspberry Pi Zero. Taking the micro SD card, we just take the Raspberry Pi, plug it in. It just goes face up into the Raspberry Pi Zero. Next step is to take the Raspberry Pi Zero, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's little notches here on the sides where you can put your fingernail underneath and pry it open. You do it gently, but once you get it open, you'll take the smaller side of this ribbon cable, and you'll take, the, there's one side that has pins on it, there's one side that has just a black backing. You want to take the black backing and put it into the Raspberry Pi. Once you have it in there, you'll close either side just to tighten it up. Very similar procedure. We're going to use our thumbnail to open up these little thumbnail notches. And the pin side will go towards the camera. The black side will go away from the camera. Get it in there tight and then Close it up on both sides and voila. Next, we plug it in. This side goes to the wall. This side will go into this port. Once it's plugged in, you'll see a little green light that flashes occasionally. That's a good sign. It means it's running. Let's go to our computer and connect to this. So Beaks, I'll start out by showing you how to do this on a Mac OS, and then I'll show you how to do it on Windows. Start out by clicking on the Spotlight Search in the upper right-hand corner. You can do this in Terminal or in iTerm. Either is fine. This is a simple command line interface. The first command we'll do is ssh techb at hive1.local. You don't need to know how these commands work, but just so you understand, the techb is the username that we created. Hive1.local is the name of the Raspberry Pi that we gave it. It's the computer name. If you're a Windows user, you can follow along. It's exactly the same commands. We'll just go to the Start menu, type in PowerShell, and we'll do ssh techb at hive1.local. If you're using a Windows machine, just go ahead and follow along, same commands. We'll type in yes, then we'll type in the password. It's techb, same as the username, with the exclamation mark. Now we're logged into hive1 as techb, and the next thing we're gonna wanna do is type in sudo raspy config. We're setting up VNC to be able to remotely access the machine. It has a nice user interface where we can just go in and do interface options, VNC, say yes. Now we can type in exit and exit. Next we'll install real VNC. You can do this on Windows, on Mac, it's exactly the same. You can also do this on a mobile device like iOS or Android if you want to use that instead. So we've installed Real VNC Viewer. Next, we'll type into this command bar hive1.local. That's the name of our Raspberry Pi. Then we'll hit enter. We'll hit continue. We'll give the username, which is techb, and the password, which is techb, all lowercase, 
exclamation mark, and click on Remember Password. This is a one-time setup. Now we're actually on the machine itself. So this allows us to do all kinds of stuff on the Raspberry Pi. So I've created some source code under Entrance Camera. It's on GitHub. You don't need to understand how any of this works. I'm just showing it to you in case you're curious, in case you would like to dig into some of the details. By creating the source code, I'm trying to eliminate as much of the heavy lifting as possible so you can just focus on your bees. In VNC, if you haven't already opened up the terminal, open it up now. First type in CD desktop. This is going to bring us to where the desktop is located. Type in the git clone command. It'll use this address to pull down all the code that I've built to this local desktop. And you'll see in the background that it has put it onto the desktop. I'm putting it on the desktop so that it's easier to find. Next type in cd entrance camera. Type in python setup.py. I've created this program to do all the heavy lifting. If your B-Yard has Wi-Fi or you plan to have Wi-Fi in your B-Yard soon, type in yes here. Then type in the email address that you created earlier. For me, that's techb.b.mail at gmail.com. Then type in the password that you created. For me, that's obau, etc. And then recipient email. Then choose how often you want the photos to be taken. These are the still photos. In my case, I'm just going to do that once a day. Then choose an option on how often you want to record the videos. You can do it not at all, which is zero. You can do it daily, which is one, or you can do it hourly, which is two. I'm gonna do that hourly. Then this part will take a bit of time. It'll install all the packages needed onto the Raspberry Pi and we'll configure everything that we need. So everything has been installed and we should be good to go. We'll type in sudo reboot, which will reboot the machine. It will stop our VNC from running. It'll show attempting to reconnect. This is normal. It's just rebooting the machine right now so that when it starts back up again, it will have all the settings that we're looking to have. And then it reconnects with the command line being closed out. This is what we would expect. That's all the techie commands we'll need for this project. Not too hard, right? Now let's move on to building the hardware. First thing we're gonna to wanna to inspect the plastic cover. You may not be able to see it, but there's a big scratch here. So that means we're gonna be wanting to put the camera in this area. So Beaks, this next part is gonna be an optional section. Instead of doing the screws that I'm gonna show you, if you don't feel like buying them and you feel like it's too much of a hassle, you can put wires through the little holes here. Then you can just tape it onto the front cover here. Same thing with the Raspberry Pi. If you just wanna let it dangle around in there, you can, or you can put onto the back uh, something like an adhesive to adhese it to, to the cover so that it doesn't jiggle around inside of there. Again, I'm going to show you how to do this using screws, which I find to be pretty a pretty clean way of doing it. Another thing to mention is if you do it this way, you also aren't making extra holes that could potentially leak. So there is something to be said for that as well. Again, not pretty, but if you are just going for functionality, this is the fastest route. So the way that I did this was I took a long nib marker and it has a long head on it. I took the camera and just around each of the holes put a dab in there. That being said, a Sharpie works just as well pretty much. It might make a little bit of a mark on the electronics, not a big deal. I've also done it a couple times just using the drill bit. That said, it's a little risky. Some of these are very small holes and you don't want to accidentally break through. I did the same on the other side with the Raspberry Pi, just measuring it out. I'm trying to make this simpler just by putting out a drawing that I made. You can cut these out around these edges and then with a screwdriver or nail you can just punch through these to make holes. Same here and then these four here. The power cord tells you where the power cord is in relation to where you're putting this and this is specifically for one that you're going to put on the right side of a beehive. So you can see here I've taped it on the sides with electrical tape. You could use any kind of tape for this. It really doesn't matter and what you see here is the power cord points to where the power cord is, power cord points to where the power cord is on this side. So before we get started, I want to mention that we're going to be using drills, we're going to be using soldering irons, we're going to be using glue guns. I just want to make sure everybody is comfortable with this before you start on it. I want you all to be very safe. The drill bit we're going to be using to begin with is a 5 64th drill bit. So let's go ahead and start drilling. I will speed this up just so that you don't have to sit and watch me do this. Now we're going to be making a hole for the power cord. I use this stencil, the 29 64ths, in order to draw this out. You don't really need to do that. You can just draw it by hand if you want to. Just use the template that I've provided. Another quick warning, before I use the soldering iron, I tried a few times with a big drill bit. And I will tell you, this is very dangerous. It grabs a hold and yanks it out of your hand. Definitely don't do this. The soldering iron is much, much easier. Again, be careful not to burn yourself. Here we go. 
simply melts like butter. And you just keep going around in concentric circles, around and around and around, until you finally get to about the, the width that you want. And all this plastic will just burn off of this tip. So no worries about that piece. And also tips are pretty cheap. Soldering irons like these are only about five bucks to six bucks at a local hardware store. And there it is. It's not a gorgeous hole, but that being said, we're going to end up filling this in with hot glue. It's going to go on the side that won't be visible on the hive also. All right, so let's start out by fastening the Raspberry Pi to the plastic unit. For this, we're going to need a few things, and then there's some optional things here. Like, I think it's really useful to be able to use a pair of pliers. Needle nose pliers work really nicely as well. I'll show you how this tape works. You don't have to use it, but I think it makes it a little bit easier. Also, the scissors are for the tape. We'll also be using nuts, spacers, washers, and also bolts. As you can see, these parts are very small. Make sure you do this in a place where it can't roll away. I'll also mention that I oftentimes use a wrist magnet just to be able to keep things handy as far as anything magnetic. Unfortunately, none of these are magnetic other than the nuts. So it really doesn't come in very handy for just about anything other than the nuts. These do roll off on you though, so good to have a strong magnet around if you have one. All right, so let's start out by fastening the Raspberry Pi to the plastic unit. Start out by grabbing the bolts and we'll put onto them the washers. They're very tiny. Once we do that, we'll put them into the holes and we'll do this one by one. Once I've got that in place, I just cut Four pieces of the tape and again this can be any kind of tape it doesn't have to be electrical tape this is just going to keep everything in place when i turn this around voila now we'll put the spacers on once the spacers are in i will put the raspberry pi in place next thing we're going to do is put a nut on there these are tricky and once you get it just at a basic tightness, you will screw on the other side. So you don't need to tighten that down super tight. Once we've got the nuts on hand tight, we can take the tape off. After the tape is off, this is where it comes in handy to have some pliers. You may not need them. You, you could just screw this down. The benefit of screwing these down fairly tight is because the washers will help to seal this from the weather. Okay, that's in there really tight. We've got the screwdriver, the pliers, spacers, and the washers, etc. We're going to put this together on this outer lens and this lens is going to go like so when we actually put this on we're going to be facing the lens of the camera outward and we're going to be putting it in place like so okay so we put the bolts in with washers and once again we're going to put these on if you haven't already cleaned the lens in this area it's a good time to do it you're not going to get much of a chance to do it after this point next spacers And then we're going to attach the lens to this outer lens here. This is the tricky part. You're going to want to turn it like this and put it in place. Next, we put the nuts on. Again, we're just putting these on hand tight. Tape off, screw in place, either using your finger on the nut or you can also use the pliers. Again, you want these fairly tight because you want it to be as watertight as possible. You'd be surprised at how much condensation that we found in the early days with these. Before taking the next step of screwing this in and then using a hot glue gun on all the joints, we want to test this out, make sure that everything is good with it. We'll test this by plugging it in and then using the VNC that I showed you earlier. We're doing that because we don't have any peripherals like a mouse or a keyboard, and we also don't have the monitor hooked up. We don't need it. So I've plugged in the Raspberry Pi. I'll put it here on the tabletop and I've got a timer that will be able to show us that the recording is running. And of course, we've got to have a B in here just to be able to show it's real. Before we close this up and use the hot glue gun, many of these plastic junction boxes come with a gasket. It's a little rubber gasket that goes around this area here. This just seals everything up nice and tight. And there we go. Then go ahead and close it up and we'll put the screws in. Once we've tested this out and we know that the electronics work, we can just screw this on. Regarding putting the hot glue on the screws, it's one of the things we learned early on. You can see here with 
the rust. Anything that doesn't get that hot glue ends up rusting. So always good to seal it up as tight as you possibly can. It just goes to show how much wear and tear it takes over the course of the year. So Beaks, the next step in the process is the glue gun. Now, this is because we, we have these gaping holes here. Obviously when condensation gets into this container, it's a bad thing. So we'll obviously fill this in. We also oftentimes will put a little bit of hot glue here, 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 here. Sometimes even on these I'll leave that up to your imagination. Also in these holes as well, and then on these potentially as well. And then we actually go around here with hot glue as well, and then finish it off with a little bit of either duct tape or electrical tape. Tronics and water, they don't mix. This extension cord is made for being outside. So there's no worries there. So let's go ahead and glue. Put a dab in each spot. When going around the edges, one of the things you may be thinking to yourself is, why don't we just use a super glue? I typically like the hot glue a little better. The main reason is that with the hot glue, I can always remove it. So I can pick it away at wherever I ended up putting it. Whereas something like a super glue, I, I can't get back out. I want to always have that option, being able to get in there and get this stuff out. Part of the reason that I like to be able to get back in there by picking out the hot glue is mainly because for example, you see the SD card. I may want to change it out in time. They actually fail occasionally with really cold weather. They do have some militarized that are built for super cold weather for high tolerances of heat and cold, but typically I just use stuff that's, that's right off the shelf. Also, there have been a few times where, you know, one component fried because of moisture getting in. And when that does happen, it typically doesn't happen for everything. It happens maybe on the board or maybe it happens on the camera or the SD card, but it typically is just one component and that's very easy to replace in comparison to replacing the entire unit. Fill in this Piece as well. Go all the way around it. This is the one part of the project that I think looks a little kludgy to be honest. That being said, it's on the side typically of the hive. You don't really see it. You see it glooped in there a little bit. Not too bad. For the finishing step, we're going to seal this up on the edges. If you make a mistake on this, you can always remove it, but you definitely want to make sure that you have tested out the system before you do this step. This dries really quickly too, which is nice. And we're doing this in order to make sure that we seal this up nice and tight. The hot glue dries really quickly, and then we're going to be using some electrical tape. We like to use white just to make it blend in, but uh, you could use any color you want. And some of these tapes that you can buy are for high temperatures and extreme conditions, and I think that's actually a pretty good way to go. The tape is something that I end up removing every year just because it ends up losing its adhesion and losing its seal. So using something like a high temperature, if you really don't care about the look of the device, probably a better bet. Again, the biggest enemy here for us is moisture getting into the device. Pretty clean look if I do say so myself. And because I'm just a little too organized, I also make a label for these. This one saying Hive 1. Every year in the fall, I take the device off of the Hive and I'll take it and store it in a garage or somewhere else. I label them so that I can put them back onto the correct Hive in the spring. Again, this step is optional for you, but I find it to be a good practice. So because I'm gonna show you really quickly how you would attach this to a Langstroth Hive made of wood. You can see here's the camera. The camera you wanna be facing the entrance here because that's where all the action is. So you would put it here. We want to be able to attach this and detach this easily. You could use the holes that are here, attach them to the side like this, which is one of the things that I really do like about this design. You could screw a couple of screws in here and it would work really nicely. But getting it off, getting it back on again is, is a bit of a pain because again, we, we want to take these off for the winter, at least in the Midwest. It gets too cold for that. What you would end up doing is using a product like outdoor Velcro. You can take one side that's just like this felt area and then this other side that's, that's kind of rugged. And I typically put the rugged side here against the hive. I'll put the felt side on here like this. The reason I use felt on this one instead of on the actual hive is because the felt, I feel like it doesn't weather as well as this plastic does. I also oftentimes will put it here as well so that there's two dimensions here. And when the winter comes, you can just pull it off. And there's also nothing saying that, for example, with hive seven, you can't have a seven A and a seven B that's showing you what's going on with the entrance. You can have it in almost like dual channels where you can see what's going on in real time. So you can see this in practice. Here's how I set it up on one of my hives in my home apiary. I wanna also mention that the plug for the power cord can sometimes phase out. Let's see how we can keep it safe. I suggest closing this up in a waterproof container. We've had a lot of problems with this in the past with these things phasing out. We've also even put duct tape around it and different waterproof solutions. So I definitely suggest putting a waterproof case around it.
It's also a much cleaner look in the garden. So one of the things I really like about having the Velcro on the side and also on the bottom, and then having the felt on the side and then also the bottom, it becomes interchangeable between the different hive types. So this is a wooden hive. Many of you know that I've been experimenting with poly hives a lot this year. Having the Velcro here on the deep and then also on the bottom board, the nice thing is, as you can see, they're separated such that you can actually take the deep off without anything interfering. When using these with a wooden hive, it would make sense to drill screws into the wood with these two pieces, but not into a poly hive. A poly hive is basically hardened styrofoam. And in that case, you really don't want to drill a ton of holes in here, especially in the places that aren't specifically hardened. And so I'm able to take the device off of the poly hive and put it onto another hive just like that. Now, if you were going to take this from one to another, you would want to call this device something agnostic, something like camera one or device one or, or monitor one or something like that. That way you can put it on any hive that you want to and you don't have to keep track. We only have one cable in this system, but for basic cable management, I do like to use just regular staples, pushing it in here, making sure that I don't hit the wire itself. You can put staples all the way across the bottom board. They pull out pretty easily if you need to pull them out, but they also stay fast pretty well on a day-to-day -day basis. I typically tend to keep it on the bottom board because that way I can pull the deep up without any real issue. Typically, unless you're a migratory beekeeper, you're probably not gonna be moving the bottom board much. And for the average backyard or even commercial beekeeper, this works pretty nicely. This is gonna be my first year using a flow hive in my apiary. So let me know in the comments below if you've used these before. I have not yet figured out how to put this onto a flow hive. They have this nice angled entrance and then the mouse guard, which makes it kind of difficult to be able to fasten it to some area here, either through screws or through Velcro. I could put it here, but then it's angled, which, isn't ideal. Maybe even below, which would be interesting to watch them actually come and fly in. Then you risk the potential for bee poo all over it. If you use a flow hive, let me know in the comments below. I'd be curious to know what you think. If your Wi-Fi doesn't reach out to your bee yard, for example, maybe you're a backyard beekeeper, but you have your bees away from the house. For my home apiary, which is about 200 yards from my house, I use this Wi-Fi extender that is able to push the signal out and it works beautifully. I just put it inside of the house, plug it into the wall, and get it as close as I possibly can to where the hives are. I hear many of you saying, well, my bee yard is nowhere near my home. There's also this other option. I use this at my northernmost apiary, and this is an external Wi-Fi extender. And this is something that you're able to use to push a signal much, much further. It goes outside. You can leave it out in the weather. You just need a power source for it. A little bit more expensive, but not crazy. Probably about 40, 50 bucks. You don't have access to Wi-Fi in your bee yard. No worries. We can set up a personal hotspot. Most mobile phones allow you to set up a personal hotspot. You won't be able to get email on a day-to-day -day basis. Then when you're in the bee yard, your Raspberry Pi will connect automatically to your personal hotspot. To set up a personal hotspot, you just go to settings, then you click on allow others to join, type in a password, and you're off to the races. Here you can see that the hotspot is available. One word of warning, when you click on this, you'll end up getting disconnected from your home network. If you don't have a monitor or anything else set up to it, this can be confusing. You want to make sure you have everything set up on the Raspberry Pi correctly before you click on this. Because once you do, you won't be able to VNC to it from your own network because it'll be on the hotspot. And I'll put in my password. And as expected, the VNC is now non-responsive because it's on a different network. I'm not able to connect to it from my laptop anymore. So here I'm using my phone in the B yard. I don't have any network but I'm able to get to hive3.local because it's on my hotspot. I click on photos and then I go down and I can see the list of pictures that were taken, which is really kind of cool. Then I go back and back and click on videos. Once I hit on videos, I can see what videos I can possibly see there. And again, I'm not using any kind of network here other than just the hotspot on my phone. This shows that even without a network, you can get a lot done. Similar to using real VNC on your desktop, you can use it directly on the mobile. I've opened my real VNC app and you can see the address is hive3.local and I've put in my username and password, which is techb and techb exclamation mark. And then all I have to do is hit connect. This will open VNC. And once I'm in VNC, it's just like when it's on the desktop. It's a little bit more clumsy because the cursor is, is difficult to use. In order to make tapping on the screen the same as a mouse click, you click this mouse click button. Once you do that, 
you can click on photos and open up a photo and it looks just like any other photo and then close it beyond using the mouse we can also use the keyboard press the chevron in the lower right hand corner to close out the mouse menu then we tap on the little keyboard which opens a virtual keyboard as an example of what we can do with the keyboard let's open the readme file and go up to the top and i'll type in hello beaks as you can see this is extremely powerful we can do all kinds of things with these virtual controls just like using a normal computer, just on your mobile phone. To disconnect the VNC session, all you do is click on the X in the lower right hand corner, then click OK. Now you'll see that Hive 3 is stored in our address book. And also, we have Hive 1 from earlier. Hopefully, you can see the power of being able to build an address book of all the different hives that we have in our apiary and being able to access them on site. If you think you'll end up doing a lot more work with the Raspberry Pi, I suggest that you build a system kind of like this one. This is my test rig that I've built. I've actually built quite a few of these. It just has the Raspberry Pi on a board here, and then I've got a mini monitor over here. Keyboard and mouse put together, which just goes to one dongle, and an on-off switch, which makes it easy to not have to pull this out and push it back in again. You can just shut it on and off from the switch, and there's not a lot of wear and tear on the Raspberry Pi as well. I think that many of you beekeepers will find this amusing. I've taken woodenware and built this. You can put it together like so. Take it off. Really easy. I've got the mini HDMI connected to the HDMI. It's just a converter that you can buy. I've got it in the description below. And we've got a converter from the micro USB to USB-A, and then I'm able to put in here a dongle that works for this keyboard that has both a, a keyboard and a trackpad. Then for the power, I have a micro USB to this Pi switch, which is really nice. You can just turn it on and off without having to disconnect. Most importantly, if you have some kind of malfunction with your BCC TV, you can just grab the SD card, put it into the SD card slot, and you're off to the races. You can test this out, get it up and running, and then pull this back out again and put it back into the BCC TV. And again, you don't need this kind of test rig. I'm just showing it to you in case you wanna do a little bit more advanced work on building these out. I don't wanna to make today's video insanely long, even though it's already pretty long. In future videos, I'll talk about power. So this obviously requires external power and not every apiary is going to have external power. In future videos, I'll talk about using different techniques in order to power this and also about different ways to be able to get a signal to it outside of Wi-Fi in general. Make sure you subscribe to the channel in order to be able to see when these things come out. I think it'll be very helpful for you. I'll provide a link here for how to clone the SD card. Changing the name of the computer is super easy. sudo raspy config. This should look familiar from when we turned on VNC using raspy config. We'll go to system options, hostname, which is kind of hard to see. And then we'll just change this to be Hive 3. And once we finish up, the Raspberry Pi will reboot. And then we'll need to connect via Hive3.local in the future. Beaks, this video has been a bit of a labor of love. Honestly, I believe that if you put one of these together, put it in your apiary, you'll have a different kind of communion with your bees. You'll have a different relationship altogether. I did this in order to help those people that are starting out with beekeeping. Maybe this is your first year. and you don't know much about beekeeping, this type of a device can help a great deal with being able to get experience with your bees, understand what's going on from week to week, from month to month, and be able to see what your bees are doing. And even if you're an experienced beekeeper, I think you'll find these devices very handy. Let me know if you have any problems putting these together. I can help out in the comments. And also send me some pictures that you're taking with this. I'd love to see it.